Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Well, today is a big day. See how she fits. Yes, welcome back to the channel. Hope everyone is doing well. So we were a little, a little bit behind. Considering this is my Christmas present that I finally got today. Yes, finally got the carburetor for the 361 here. It was a special order. And Leck, my wife, got that for me for Christmas. This is the, the Brawler series. It's a 650, four barrel carb. Uh, manual choke, which is exactly what I wanted. And... As you see here, we have mechanical secondaries on the other side there. Exactly what the doctor ordered. Uh, I gotta get myself, I gotta get some vacuum line from a vacuum advance. Gotta get some fuel line, that's pretty important. Fuel line down to the fuel pump. And I'm gonna have to make a line or something. I'm gonna have to figure out something temporarily for that pump to pull from a jug or a can. Uh, Got to get the carburetor torque down itself. We got to make sure our floats are good. They're all on the other side there. We got to get that thing cranking without firing, making sure that those uh, the uh, bowls are going to fill up correctly. Uh, supposedly, this is set for six and a half psi. I think it is our six point seven psi for fuel pressure. The pump I have, I know, is putting out five seven, so I may have to adjust the floats to allow a little bit more fuel in. We can tell that by back, where are we at here? Back here. These are the sight glasses. We want the fuel to be basically centered on there. Now, uh, because I'm running about a pound, maybe 0.8 of a pound less, we'll have to double check that. It should be fairly close though. There's a bit of, you know, there's a bit of uh, lenience there. But man, that looks nice. And I'm so happy. I just got enough room for my coil. I can keep everything where it's at. I really wanted the coil on this side just because my wires are going to go down that way. I didn't want to have to run two sets of wires going different directions. So that is really nice that that fits right down in there. So we're just going to cover that up for just a little bit here. And we're going to work on our axe a little bit. So like I said, need some lines. Need to find out the actual fitting size that's on that mechanical pump. It should draw from a tank, no problem. Just got to make a temporary thing. But I'm going to get on to assembling this axle. I need some space. I'm going to pull the engine over in here to work on it and get her running. So all I've done here is drop my pinion assembly or my uh, differential assembly in here. Got the bolts on. Torque this down. These get torqued down to 45 foot-pounds. I got my seals, my main inner seals done. Those are the ones that hold the differential, the gear lube inside there. And then, of course, I've got... My backing plate seals, these are the ones that seal the grease on the grease side of it. Um, the cup and cone bearing, they get packed to grease just like just like a wheel bearing on the outside here. And they stay completely separate from each other. Uh, downside, my pinion seal doesn't fit. Wrong size. Not quite sure what happened there. I went by my 10 bolt, 8 and 3 quarter rear end, the whole works. But even though I had the casting number put into the computer it gave me the wrong seal number what I got here is a 7216 which is the most common one available there was like 10 listings for this but there was two other listings for two other bearing two other seals that didn't seem to fit the bill but that one's too big and the other one seems smaller there's the original so 
Gonna get back on that today and measure it up and uh, hopefully get a new one coming. Now once I get this together, I wanna be able to put the whole thing under the car all in one piece. So just trying to, I'll probably use something thicker than that. Uh, most of the weight of the rear end is gonna be right over the jack. But I wanna make something so that I can put my axle on, wheel it over, and I'll raise it up all the way under the car and then I can put my leaf springs on and then set it back down on there. Now, I don't know where's my light at. Been busy. Some light under here. We've got we've got a floor coated. Oh, where are we at here? There we go. I have it all treated back here. All rust, it was rust treated, scraped all down, ground down, rust treated. Got her all primed up, which I use a dark, dark, um, rust proofing paint to seal that up and turn it to a hard, like a hard plastic. And then I've gone through with the rubberized floor coating and I got it all completed. I did it just up, just, just to the front there so far, just where I'm working at, because it'll make it so much easier to get that all done there without having that axe on the way. So that'll be, that'll be awesome. That'll keep her good for another 60 years, hopefully. Well, we have issues, and I kind of know the issue. Don't know how it's possible I have this issue, but uh, yeah, there's there's a problem here, and this is probably going to take a smarter man than me because I cannot figure out how this has happened. So, the issue I'm having is the right axle. Okay, will not go into the carrier all the way. The left axle drops right in. No problem at all. Makes it all the way in. So let me show you where I'm at or tell you where I'm at now. So I've measured both axles. They are identical size, identical length, identical spline, no difference. <clears throat> but when I did take them apart, I marked them. Either way, all my parts are marked. So I know left stay with left, right stay with right. Just like everything I've done on the car. So the axis is the exact same, identical sizes and everything. From the locking collar here on the carrier to both sides, it's the exact same distance into the carrier to the pin that separates the two shafts. It's the same distance on each side. Now if you look here, you can see this little mark. It's like a little shoulder. It's the same shoulder that's on this shaft except we're out three quarters of an inch. So now let me pull these axles out and I'll show you what's going on. So here we are looking at the left side of the differential as it would sit in the car. Of course, this is the top. Uh, now before I go any further, both axles, left and right axle, both fit in this side, no problem at all. They go all the way in. So anyway, down in here, you can see the splines. And that's what the axles, the ends of the axles, sit in. But if you look close, you see that gap in the middle? Well, there appears to be two separate types of gears in there, two gears. And they have to turn together, but it appears that they are separate items because there is a line in between there. Funny thing is, there's not one breakdown on the internet that I can find that shows two separate pieces in there. Only one. They call it the side gear. I would call it a spider gear. Just what I'm used to, but they call it the side gear. So either or. And we come around to the right hand side where the axle will not go in. Let's see if I can get this to you. See if you can see this. Right, let's see here. Right there. They don't line up. See how they're off? They're off about a sixteenth. Just a hair. Just enough that the end of that shaft hits on them and it will not go through. Now, again, why is there two pieces? I don't, I don't know. Now this is a side with the clutch carrier on the side of it. Now down in, down in there, where are we at here? Where are we at? There we go. The tooth of the gear you see there, that's the spider gear. So I have taken, I have taken my caliper and I've spread it out and I've gone all the way down inside here till I touch the pin, the shiny pin. And then I can see by the size 
that it is correct. I am in line where the pin is. So that's fine. The distance is good. Nothing has moved outwards out of this diff. And it's the same as the other side, which is good. But this is my question. Why is there two? Why is there two gears in there? Why is there two separate pieces? Um, they move together. They have to move together because the shaft goes all the way through. And I do know that's on the limited slip side. But two things. I find it hard to believe that I could break those clutches free that are dry just by turning that yoke by hand, which I have. I've turned it by hand. But I find it hard to believe that I'm able to break that free by turning that by hand. And the second thing is, how come the parts list does not show that? It shows every single piece through here, but it only shows one spline gear inside, which is the side gear. All right, it's been 45, 40 minutes since I last videoed the little cut here. And you know what? I don't know if I'm jumping the gun. Maybe I should be looking into this before I'm posting. But you know what? Uh, this is this is it. I want you guys to see that it's not just always easy sailing. Something sometimes crap happens. So I was looking, and of course I found a thread, like an old thread from like 2009. And I read it, and of course it says exactly what I absolutely did not want to hear. And it said. Absolutely, on the Sherlock, which is this is, because absolutely do not turn the differential assembly without the rear axles in. <sighs> so, that's kind of, I'm, I'm correct with what I'm saying. The axle that goes through here, it ties the one set of clutches to the spider gear, or the side gear side. And of course the other half that slip are on the other side of the, the carrier. So somehow, I don't know how I, like this thing is so easy to turn. Somehow I have s s turned the clutch. And now I gotta try to figure out getting the axle on the good side, somehow strapping it or something, holding it tight enough that I can put a pipe wrench on the other axle and try to turn that just slightly enough so I could find the spot to get them together. And uh, they said a quick rattle after they're in should set the spline so there's no tension on it. And then of course I gotta get it back in there without turning it again. And uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. I'll figure something out. All right, Paul is a happy boy again. A happy boy. So, from my adjuster plate, I have 28 and a quarter now. Going from the adjuster plate on the other side, minus the nut, I am 28 and a quarter, and I watched it slide in. Not too hard. I'm actually was surprised. It was easier to slip that clutch than I thought. Now. If I get around here, where's my dot? I actually can't even see the dot. It went in so far. Oh, there it is. Way down in there. And it's funny, it's exactly lined up where the adjuster, where the adjustment ends. Exactly where it's at. I wonder if that was the original alignment dot when they put this thing together. But now I got to get these out, get this turned up and in without turning that at all. I guess I could do this. I could do this again when it's in the axle. I'd rather not. It was much easier to see it, so I can hold it while I'm doing it and pushing it in. But uh, see if we can get this thing back together. All right, I got it in, and my bearing is sitting in there perfect now. And I got the same distance on both ends sticking out. So while it's together and axles in, I'm gonna torque this down again. Get this back on. I'm gonna get my race and I'm gonna finish up this side. It should be good. And then we'll go and I'll show you exactly what I'm doing to put this together. All right, so got my axle cleaned and prepped in my vise. Now these axles, they get bigger as they go to the seat where the uh, seal sits, but we stop just below it and I got that good and tight in the vise here. 
So I get everything cleaned up, no burrs, no nothing, polished it off. I even used 2000 grit right here. Use a 2000 grit paper and I just rolled it around to make sure it's nice and smooth. And I got a little bit of grease on there, just a little bit. Now that axle was sitting over there. Might as well do it. Sitting by the door and it is 42 degrees Fahrenheit. So over here at the fire, cooking me up some bearing. <laughs> and this one is at, let's see here. It bounces around. We'll say two, 140, 140 Fahrenheit. That's been on there for about 10, 12 minutes. I'm gonna leave it a little longer. If I can get it up to 150 constant, then I'm gonna bring it over quick and uh, tap it on that shaft. All right, got a bearing coming in hot. Just get that lined up there very nice. Got a piece of pipe that just fits over and sits right against the race. Want to make sure it's not sitting on that cage at all. And then we just dab it straight down. Make sure everything's going straight and smooth. I know it's not ideal, but it's the best thing I got now for not hitting on any other part of the bearing. Almost there. Make sure it's not on that cage. There, you can hear the difference in sound. That's it. That bearing is on. All right, we are perfectly seated against the shoulder. Now, I know there's going to be people probably complaining about that, but whatever. You know what? I put a million bearings on before with a punch on the end there, uh, hoping that I don't chip it. It's a good flat surface, hits the whole bearing at once, so it's nice and straight. And I didn't damage and I didn't touch the cage at all. So yeah, it's on there, it's on there good. Now, the next part, get a rubber glove and a whole handful of grease, and I'm gonna squish that grease in there and pack that. I really wish I had a grease packer, though I don't know if it would work for this uh, application because normally you have to put it in the machine, then onto the axle, then I wouldn't be able to heat it up, which would require a lot more pounding, which I don't really want to do. So it's a little takes a little longer, but it is what it is, and we'll get it done. All right, so there's a cavity between the bearing. The, the bearing, <laughs> sorry, I'm on the tripod, on the bearing and where the seal starts. So I've made sure I filled that up the best I can, but not too much. You don't want to force that grease down past that seal and inside the tube. But I got that in there, got it all packed nice. <clears throat> oh, that's going to be in the way. There we go. And now. We have the axle here. We gotta be careful. We don't drag it on that seal. Just uh, we'll set it down gently. Then once we get so far, we can actually slide on the tube of the axle and not put any force on that seal at all. So now that I'm gonna get some leverage in here. And try to find, oh, there it is. And there we go, we're all the way in. All right, so I've packed this again with grease, the whole cavity. Now, just like the other side, I packed it good, all the excess came out this way around the race. So uh, 
more, more, I'd rather waste a little bit and know that she's full in there than not have enough. So now we've got to put the race in. I'm going to warn you right now. If you don't like seeing squeamish things, look away. Go find something to do for a minute. I don't want to hear it. I have looked everywhere for a piece of pipe that would fit this race and I have nothing. This is what I got and this is how it's going in. Moving nice and slow. Not forcing it. Gentle taps. Races are brittle. You do not want to break them. And that's all I'm going to do, really slow, until it's all the way in. And there we are. They are both in. Got all my excess grease cleaned up. And she's turning smooth. Now my next step, well actually, I'm going to put the nuts on there and torque that down. But the next step of this is that these races, they fit in, the, in a groove that's shouldered. So they can only go in so far. My... Um, the shims that I took out, there was two of them in it, and the new ones I got have a thin layer on them as well too, that's non-compressible, but it does help it seal better. Uh, how many I put in here depends on this lip. Now there is a slight lip, very small. On this side, and this side here, it might be a hair more, and that's where my shims come in effect. I gotta get my feeler gauges out, and uh, see what kind of space there is until I can feel it smooth to slide another shim over top of it till it's not catching that edge. I believe it is only as thick as the seals that I need to put on, but you know, never assume. So we're gonna double check that, torque that down, and that's gonna be her. I finally got the axles in. Sorry there wasn't a whole lot of different content. Uh, I was getting pretty worried there for a while, but yeah. She's falling together. Anyway, I'm going to cut her off there. Clean up a little bit. A little goopy. That grease is sticky. Uh, I should have mentioned as well, uh, the bearings inside here. You want to make sure you're using an EP2 grease. That is what is recommended in the manual for the Chrysler. And not only do you want it to be the EP2, <coughs> sorry, you want to make sure that it's the high tack with the limp lithium in it. It comes right in the grease. So it's an EP2 high tack with lithium. That's what they recommend. I maybe today's greases you can get away with something different. But you know what? They sell it still. It's not much more than a regular tube. So when it went. So I have my backing plate on one side here. Got it all torqued down. Bolts go to 45 foot pounds. Even touched up a little paint. Looking good. But, I played around with my end play last night, trying to calculate it. It's hard to do, because it's a cup and cone and they're pressed together. But, going by the manual, and going by measurements, the distance of the cone, where it sits either above or below this surface right here, where it goes in. And, of course, going with calipers, because I always got to go with calipers. Uh, the new seals I got, two of them are too thick. Uh, one is too small. So mix and matching and I found out that all those shims that I had there, there's two different size sizes. So it's getting one regular shim and one of my new fancy seals. The shim sealing against the axle housing itself should be fine. I'm going to use the one that has the fancy little raised edge to go against the backing plate and help crush that in. But that, that should be perfect. That should be giving me just what I need. And what I mean by end play here is that once this is all together, 
And this axle, get in there. And the bearings start to seat themselves in. It's going to allow that cone to seat wherever. <clears throat> every, if, I, every, if I take a hard left or hard right, that axle going back and forth, there's got to be a little bit of play. Right? There's going to have to be a little bit. Just like your wheel bearings, there's a tiny bit of play in them. Remember, there's a pin that separates the two shafts on the inside. You don't want that you know, grinding together hard. So this will give it just a little bit to relax. I think it's, it's man, yeah, it's a little more than 10 thou. I think it's probably about 12. Zero, or not, yeah, I think it's 0 0.12. 0 0.012 is what I think it is. So that should be good, as best my calculations can. I'll find out real quick after the first real good drive when I'm cruising around and I go back and I reach underneath and touch this. It'll let me know real quick if it's too tight. But the next step is to put the other one on. Make sure it's going in the right direction, just like that. A little bit of lube around that seal so we don't uh, drag it dry across that shaft. Get it together. Again, 45 foot-pounds. We'll get the other plate on. All right, so the jumping back and forth. You know what? I'm not going to apologize for it anymore. It's uh, just getting too hard to do two videos all the time, especially when I'm doing things like putting a bearing on where it's kind of hard to do it all together. And, uh, and then do it again. <coughs> Sorry, do it again. But anyway, here we are. So we got, uh, got a backing plate put on. So bearings are set. I got my spacers in here. We're going to talk about that in a second. Backing plate on. And of course, we got the bolts on. They go 45 foot-pounds. Now, what I had to work out, and actually it was pretty easy, worked out really good, is the original, the original... Well, those aren't really seals. There's this, it was actually like styrofoam. There was styrofoam on each side of these shims. And this is my shims for my end play and my axle. So the new ones, the new and improved ones that go against the uh, backing plate. They're, I don't know what kind of material they are. They're, they're metal. They're, of course, they're stainless steel, but they've got kind of a rubbery, velvety coating on it. And I suppose a seal a lot better to the backing plate. The flat surface on these will seal fine to the axle. So I brought in four, four of them, two for each side, but with the coating, they became thicker. So I had to figure out my end play, and that is once I put the cup and cone together in here, and I put the cup in, there is a little bit of a distance here, right on the inside, where the cone matches the face of the, uh, of the tube, axle tube. They can't be flush, like perfectly flat. There's no movement, it's too tight. So I measured up my shims and found out actually that the shims were different sizes, three different sizes actually. And measured them up on both sides and I came up to a good conclusion of which one goes where. So I have, this is the thicker of the two over there. That goes on first and then this will be the fancy, the fancy seal with that rubbery stuff on. Again, the back side will seal nice. This will seal nice to that side. And that little raised that little raised edge will crush nice onto the backing plate, which isn't quite as smooth as the rest of it. That helps seal it up good. Keep the grease in there, because, yeah, this end gets greased. It's well greased. <laughs> I, I wasted probably about twice as much as it required, but I'd rather have a little extra come out and know that i got no pockets in there to make sure I don't burn these bearings out. But I'm going to throw the other backing plate on. And we're just going to roll right into her. There we go. Everything is moving nice. Moving good and smooth and easy. So there we are. Backing plates on. And torque down. Now, I got something today. Nothing too exciting. But uh, very, very much necessity. Come on out of there. First thing, gas cap, <laughs> old school, old style. Got myself a gas cap, so that was awesome. And a new sending unit for my tank. So the fuel pickup, fuel pickup, and of course a sending unit to let me know if I'm empty or full 
probably going to be empty more than anything. I don't think she's a get. I don't think she's a fuel efficient vehicle. Not parking in that fuel efficient parking only spot. But yeah, something else to get here because before this axle goes back into the car, we got to get that. Got to get that tank up in there. So it'll be going in just like something like that. Yeah. Yeehaw. Now I did have a viewer ask me about my hubs and if they uh, were lefts and rights with the, the wheel studs. And yeah, they definitely are. So I'll see if I can get this in the light here. Actually, I'll take one off because... Which way are we going here? There we're going this way. See if I can get a good view of it. But you can see there's a little little R on there. There's an R on that one. Let me come over here. Oops, of course I gotta turn the other way. If you look at the light, there's a little L. So yeah, there is a there is lefts and rights. And that's uh, definitely important to figure out. Oh, and just like that, I went and put the wrong one on the wrong side. Okay to do with your fingers. Not okay if you're gonna throw a torque wrench on there. But yes. <clears throat> Right hand side of the car has right hand thread, left hand has left hand thread. And I guess it's the way it was back then. I don't know if it, I don't think it really mattered obviously because I don't think there's a car today that does that. Now comes the next part, is to put the hubs on. Now I've cleaned up the key and the keyway and they're stiff, like they're, they're snug, you don't want them slopping, but they do, they do go in my hand, so. Got to get this together, tap it on gently until it starts to snug up, and got to put them on with 145 foot-pounds. Now, I don't know if I can do it here. I'm going to get two bars. I'll put a bar through my hanger here and, you know, go opposite each other and see if I can get 145 pounds that way without slipping off the bench. If not, <clears throat> again, I'll have to do it up, wait till it's on the car to finish it off, and get to that and also i don't think i have a cotter pin into my name in this place so uh, i'll line them up i got a bunch of little drawers but i don't think i own a cotter pin so there you go i get a get a notch off my man card i could put a nail through it that'd work no we're not putting any nails through it <laughs> pulling up the old copper anti -seize. we're going to put a little bit of that on this shaft as well and also in this side where it fits around the keyway. Make my life easier down the road if I gotta take this off. And if it's not me, somebody will probably be happy that I did that at some point. So, tap it on, snug it up, and see if we can get it torqued down. All right, that went pretty easy. I just put my bar on the nuts between the axles here. And it was one, 145 minimum. So I had to go a little bit more just so I could get it to go far enough so that the hole lined up the castle dot so I can put my pin through. So that one's done, one more to go. All right, backing plates are all on and looking good. Now all we got left on is put the hubs. So I got the shafts all cleaned up. Got a little bit of copper coat on there. It's a Pentex brand though, but that's right there, that's anti seize It'll save me the trouble down the road if I ever got to take this off. Hopefully it's not me though. Hopefully uh, somebody else, <laughs> it'll be it's their job and they'll be happy that I did it. So get the keyway in there, get it lined up. Just gonna snug that hub on there. And then I'm just gonna get my punch wherever I put it, there it is. Gonna set the keyway just a just a hair in behind. Let me get a torque. Torque that cast nut down. Now this is going to 135 foot pounds or 145 foot pounds minimum. So what I'm doing, I'm going to 145 45 foot pounds to pull it in. <clears throat> then I'll check it wherever the hole is. I'll just go a little bit past 
wherever it lines the hole up for the cotter pin on the castle mount. There we go. There we go. Five and oh, perfect. <laughs> Let's see if we can see that. Look at that. Perfect with the hole. That's good. Because uh, she's starting to lift. I'd have to go a little too far. There we are. All touched up. No more rust showing. Looking good there. Same goes on the other side. All touched up. Nice gap. Looking good. All to spec. There's just one more thing. There we go. And there we go with that. That is my final look. The chrome wheels, the mags that I'll have. I really want to see red showing through there. It's gonna have the red stripe down the car. We got bright red shocks, torsion bar, and a couple of small things on the front will be red. Not a lot, not a lot. <clears throat> so my drums are definitely being red. Now in the back, I did paint the back of the, the rear, the rear diff. I don't know if that will stay or not. You guys let me know what you think. It's a little too much for this car. I guess you don't really know until we get it all together and paint it and done. That can be painted black again anytime. No issue at all. But I thought from behind, you're not going to see the drums because they're going to be inside the, the uh, rims. But you'll have two bright Colored red shocks coming up the sides, red diff in the center, underneath the car in the front, torsion bar and a couple leading edges, leading arms will be red as well, only a little bit. And then the car itself with red accents inside will have the fire red stripe right down the side. So I just popped the drums off this thing to make it a little easier to move around. But here we go. We are gonna put this thing in. We're gonna put the whole rear end back together now. Just got the jack or the axle on the jack here. You know, I didn't need to make a bracket. It just fits on there perfectly and it floats just nice. She's good and solid, good to stay there. So my plan is I'm gonna jack this all the way up until it sits on the bump stops and it'll be as high as it can go. Then I'll put the front hangers on, I'll put the rear clevis hangers on the back, and then I'll be able to lower that axle down onto the pins, which are right there. And once I get it on there, then I'll be able to take my measurements front to back and across diagonal side to side to get it as square as we can for a start underneath the car. Uh, the final, I guess the final alignment will be an actual alignment when I'm done because we are pulling apart the front end as well too. So we'll definitely have to get it, make sure it's getting an alignment, make sure she's straight. Uh, I could do the old string, string alignment, but you know what? It's not that much. You might as well send it in and get it done. So... Got the front uh, hanger bolts all lubed up with a uh, copper coat because they go through the center bushing, which is a metal insert. <clears throat> the back hangers, the bolts go straight through the rubber grommets. So I'll be using lithium grease on those just to keep the squeaks down, keep the rust from building up in there. Hopefully it'll save them a little longer. And yeah, we'll just throw her in. Step one complete. Front hangers are on. Things are going smoothly. And there the rear hangers are on and uh, not only do I have my axle set in place but it is torqued down with the u-bolts so what I did for measurements I took a measurement from the inside here the inside hanger to the face of the axle that's what I did so both sides are identical u-bolts the new u-bolts fit perfect they are tight tight to the bend they're touching the whole way around. They're tight to the spring pack. And I got some actual bolt hanging below here. Maybe a little too much. I could cut it off. I don't think it really matters. I'm still not as low as the bottom of my diff. But the original ones that are on here, when I took them off, it was halfway inside the nut, the U-bolt. So they're definitely no good. But they're on, they're torqued. Torque on those said 90 to 95 foot-pounds. I went to 95 foot-pounds just because I did paint my springs and stuff, and I thought maybe a little bit of chafing of the, of the paint might uh, make that stack come together just a little bit more. 
So I'll put that extra torque on there and stretch them out just so it'll help take up some of that slack. Alrighty, cleaned up my tools. But I got her all together. I even got the shocks on. Oh. And that, man, it's a whole lot of shine underneath here. That is looking awesome. Now, you can see over there, I don't get that wheel well done yet. Scrape it a little bit more, but that's the original undercoating. It's going to go just like the other one, but I still got to pick up one more can. I'll just throw a towel and a rag over the end of that axle. But that's that's it. The rear, the rear end is done. Better than a Craigslist rebuild. Not just a spray bomb. <laughs> we peeled her apart, cleaned her up, made sure everything was good, and finished her off. Now, got to get a tank in this thing. That's the next step. Actually, I got to scrap the tank idea. Because I forgot that I'm waiting for a large grommet. There's a big rubber grommet that goes in there. And then the filler neck, of course, fits in there as well, too. It was uh, originally, I ordered it. Package was lost. I had to order it again. So I've been waiting almost three weeks now for this thing. But I have to have that grommet to put that in. It's going to be way too hard to try to shove it in when it's down inside that hole there. So we got to hold off on the tank. So I decided time to start working on the front suspension. So we got the whole car up on jack stands, all four, and we are flying high. Now, going way back, I did the same thing up front here as I did to the back. I put the big puller on to remove the drum, except I was never able to get the hub separated from the drum. I had to take off the spindle nut, and I removed it all as one piece. <clears throat> and I have that over here on my bench. So I got the whole drum and the hub uh, with the bearings, seat, and the the races and everything are all in here. So what I did is I cleaned it up a bit and I filled up this little pocket here with some penetrant and it kind of made a way through on this one. It actually worked its way underneath there and come out. So something is getting under there. That might come apart. This one though did the same thing. Nothing come through. And it actually, all it did was wick its way up and start working its way around the drum. Which kind of sucks a bit because I really need to get it underneath there, get that eaten through. Now, I did have these sitting for a bit overnight. This one, probably going to come apart. Now this one though, I think you might have to put another run of juice around her and see if it just needs a little more time. Alright, so another, what, another six hours of soaking the juice on it. You can see I got one apart already. Hopefully this will be just as easy as the other one. Barely even made a dent in my wood. Just like that. I can't believe the torque I put on those with a puller. When they're originally on the car, they wouldn't get apart. But just you let that, let that, uh, that penetrate sit on there for a while. And away she goes, just like that. No pulling, no banging, no destroying of things. <laughs> the part just beautiful. So now I'm gonna knock out all my studs here, get this cleaned up, get my races out. And uh, yeah, once I get it all cleaned up and all the oil off it, I can put these in the sand blaster, give them a little cleanup. So they came apart, no problem. Got them both out, end up getting my all my studs out as well too, knocked them out of there, and then I tapped out the bearing races. So I got them out just to get some numbers and it's perfect. Again, everything on here, made in Canada, all the drums, all the hubs, the shafts, everything's made in Canada, Timken. But uh, we get good numbers, LM11910, easy to read, the LM number. Right there on the end of that bearing as well too. Same goes with the other ones. So that'll be easy to do. I'll cross those numbers, check them out at work, see what I can find. Now, the only odd thing is this inner wheel seal. It's three pieces. It's just kind of this tin cage that you see right here. And then it's got another piece that's pressed inside of it. And I'm pretty sure 
that all these old original seals are made out of leather. That's a strip of leather that's in there. Now, I didn't see that in any of the breakdowns. Uh, I assumed it was there. I was just assuming it was like a lip seal, oil seal, but not something like that. So, I'm going to get some measurements off that. I'm going to head on to Rock Auto. Now, even if you don't buy from Rock Auto, their site is awesome. The breakdowns are great. And all these seals and bearings and nuts and stuff and hubs, they give a lot of dimensions inner and outers and so it's really easy to find something you know yeah your measurements if a lot of them are in millimeters you might not be close if you're working back and forth but it's not like this seal is a half a millimeter off from another one you'll you easily you can very easily tell what it's going to be and like i said even if you don't buy from rock auto it's a great site just to get information on the parts that you need so now next step over here is to get rid of this backing plate and everything Except the backing plate is actually holding everything together. The backing plate is holding the tie rod arm on there. It's also holding the spindle, which is tied into the, the ball joints, which is then bolted, of course, to the torsion or the drag link. I think you call it the drag link. This lower bar pulls to this axle forward and back a little bit, side to side. And the top one is my torsion bar. And then, of course, this whole thing, outside of the shock, is uh torsioned up right there with those rods that big rod you see there there's one on this side too right there and those are under tension so what i gotta do is i gotta try to get everything apart here hopefully it comes apart in one piece uh, safely get the ball joints knocked out of it and get this lower arm to swing under as low as i can to take all the tension off that uh off that torque i don't know what you want to call them torque rod torque arm whatever they are Got to get all the torque off that because they're wound up. That is, that's your suspension. That's your, the travel coming up. That's like the spring on the back that they get, they just twist those things tighter. Your shock stops the bounce, but that is your suspension. So take me a little while to get in there. There's a lot of, a lot of bolts back here. I'm going to have to put some juice on and they're all cotter pin too. I don't know why they did that, but they're all cotter pin. I guess this is a safety thing and hopefully we can get it apart in one piece. All right, we got to fast forward here and jump. This was a learning experience, and I wanted to get through this before we actually go through it and uh, and see how it's done. But I have got everything pulled out of the side, minus the torsion bar, which is just hanging, or the sway bar, and also uh, the steering rack or the steering linkage. Uh, that's going to be a separate piece in itself. So it's all out, all apart. All the pieces are kind of scraped down and what's going to go get into my blaster. Uh, of course, one long piece that won't fit there, but that's it. It all come apart and uh, that's the way the other side is going to go. So that's what it looks like. <clears throat> Here's where we're at right now. Everything intact. Let's get at it and hopefully this side comes apart good as well. The first thing I'm going to jump on here when I do this cut my brake line off of course but i'm taking out all my cotter pins everywhere around one of them caught me real good on the thumb and ripped me open but i'm taking all the cotter pins off now the way i'm going to disassemble the suspension is a little bit backwards normally to remove your lower control arm your torsion bar which is your suspension running back there right where are we at here right right there that long bar Going all the way back. Normally, you would get underneath the car here, and just like on Chevys and other vehicles, it's got a big teardrop shaped uh, connection on the end that's hexed on there, and it's a long bolt, about six inches long, and that bolt goes all the way up and puts all that tension and torque on there. Normally, you take that and take that all the way down almost to the end just to relieve as much pressure as you can on this. But here lies the problem. Uh, I have the thing soaking in uh, in penetrant to the, eat that rust off. But <clears throat> it is so hard to take off of the impact. Uh, my impact is good for 1,400 pounds breakout, breaking force. If I was under there using my impact trying to take that nut off and it broke the stored energy in that spring, when that snapped and that arm come down... It would if I if it left my hand on my arm it would be good, but I'm it would cause some serious damage. It would be some issues. So what I'm doing is kind of backwards. 
I'm taking it apart up here, lifting it up with my jack, using the weight of the car to hold the suspension, then let my jack down slowly and let that lower control arm swing away, and then it's nice and loose, and then I can tackle it in, in the back there. Now the other side come apart. It was hard. It took a long time to get that bolt all the way out. It's a fine thread, of, like I said, about six inches long. But I did get it apart, and it didn't break, and it's fine. But I'm not taking a chance. I'd rather go this route, play a little bit safe, then I know I'm not going to be losing appendages or fingers or anything like that. So all cotter pins are removed. Things are ready to come apart. I removed the control with a drag link or whatever you want to call that thing. I got it out of the way. Two, three quarter inch bolts holding it in. Next step is four bolts going through the backer plate for the brakes. Now on diagonal, these two, they hold the steering arm on. The other two hold the backing arm on. That's all held together onto the spindle. So we're going to zap those four off, get the plate out of the way, and the steering arm we're just pushing aside for now. I will be removing it from the uh, pitman arm, but that, that'll be when this is all done, and then everything will be coming out as one piece, and I'll disassemble that on my bench, taking a little more care, because I do believe it's going to be hard to get that thing apart. So four bolts, backing plate off, and we'll see how it looks. Okay, with backing plate out of the way, now it's time to remove the lower ball joint. The upper one, I take the, I took on the other side, I took the upper control arm and the spindle off as one. I took it over the bench to do it. <clears throat> but the bottom one, hopefully I'm going to be as lucky as the other side. So on the other side, all I did was loosen off the nut and gave the arm one hit right there and this boom, it it come out. The tension was enough to slam that out of there. Is this going to happen here? I don't know. But uh, I got my jack in there to catch it. I'm just about, oh, not even a quarter off. I'm going to give it a little whack, and hopefully we get as lucky as the other side, and that'll drop right down. All right, nut is off. Can we be lucky twice? No, we cannot. <laughs> All right, I'll get the nut back on there, get some uh, anti-seize working its way in there, and see if we can free it up. Damn, I literally walked away and I let go. Yep, look at that, she popped. Done. So, now I just gotta bring some tension back up so I can get the lower shock bolt out. I wanted to make sure there was something holding that together. Then we'll slowly lower that down and take all the tension off it. That is awesome. All right, there is the front spindle nut, which goes on there, which helps hold that lower control arm in. And I have the large adjuster bolt on the back taken out. So literally, I just gotta crawl under here, grab that with two hands, that should slide right out of there. There we go. You know what, I love working on the old cars, but the rust and crap holding the stuff together is just, just brutal. But I got it out. Now, this does break down again. We have the little control arm, torsion rod, and the adjuster on the end. Those are all three pieces that come apart. They do a little, this is not gonna be so bad, I don't think. The other one had some grease left in it, which was good. This end, there was a bugger to get out of there. So, whew, <laughs> out of breath yanking all this stuff. So I'm gonna this time I'm gonna shoot a little never seize in there first. I'm gonna clean up under there. I'm gonna start getting ready to take off the whole steering linkage. That's all that's left under. Oh, you know what? Sorry, the upper control arm. I gotta get ready to take that upper control arm off, which has a spindle hanging from it. And we'll finish disassembling that over on the workbench so I can use the vise. Alright, next step. Upper control arm which still has a spindle attached to it. So we're just crawled right in the engine bay here. First thing I'm gonna remove is the adjusting bolts or adjusting cams. These are what are used to do your alignment. Now the hole is flat on one side, so is the bolt. And these, when you turn it, that's what changes the angle of your wheel. This will pull these in and out as they go. Now before I took it off, I did mark it. I also marked on the side here. And just like the other one I did, before I clean this up, 
take a file and I just cut just a little tiny edge, a little file mark in there. And I'm gonna put a little teeny tiny one on here as well too. Just enough noticeable that I can feel it or just see it. And uh, it won't be, won't be perfect, but you know what? It's where it was when it last drove. So hopefully it'll be close enough, at least to do a little test drive and to get it to the inspection station to actually get it inspected and get an actual alignment. So it's just two bolts, we'll remove those. This whole thing's gonna drop right out. There it is, upper control arm and spindle out. And the shock is off. And just like the other one, I had to cut the end off. So, we're doing good. Now we gotta start breaking down these parts, getting things taken out, bushings out. Gotta remove the uh, brake caliber from the back of the backing plate, get that cleaned up. And then we're gonna jump on to the main torsion bar here in the lower control arm and try to separate these three pieces. So now I am for sure replacing uh, ball joints. That was, that was part of the deal with all this. So it makes getting the ball joints out super easy. All I just set one end of the vise and just whack with a hammer right on the end and she pops right out. Now these ball joints, these are screwing ball joints. There they are there. You can see the threads. So all I've been doing, the other side is I just welded on an old nut to the outside. This does take a wrench, but it's an inch and seven eighths, which I don't have. Uh, I do have uh, good pliers to put it back in with, but they're so tight in here, I can't get a grip on them to loosen them off. But yeah, they're a, they're a very coarse thread, not real deep, but they thread in. So yeah, it's gonna weld a couple nuts to the top of them, put the old Dugga Dugga machine on there and get them out. Now, uh, this, this bad boy here, I know they cost a little bit of money. Uh, it took me some time to get one, but this here, this will change your life if you get one of these. You're working on cars, anything big, all this big stuff, nuts and bolts, seven eighths plus. This thing will take anything off. And if the bolt don't move, she's coming off in pieces. <laughs> so I'm not real looking forward to taking this apart. Uh, the pitman arm coming off the power steering pump. I really want to leave that alone. Like I had mentioned before, I've had this car now about two and a half years. It doesn't leak a drop. The power steering pump is still full. I've used that wheel cranking it around enough that I broke the original hose and I shot oil outside like crazy and I've also poured some in my on my pad unfortunately. So that pump doesn't leak so I really want to be careful with it. So I got a couple things from work. Got a couple tools here. Got a small one of these. What you want to call it? I don't know what you, I don't know what you actually call them. But what this does is it's got a tapered shoulder inside. And you take this apart. And you got to make sure I got the right one, depending on what size the hole is in the middle. But you put it in between here. And as you tighten it up with a wrench, that wedge starts going in there and pulls that joint apart. Now, this here, I sprayed this down three days ago. So it's got juice on there. I'm hoping that's eating in there good. So hopefully one of these will work. This one has been, well, she's been well used <laughs> and abused. So hopefully one of these will work and get it in there, start cranking on her and get that off just nice. But first I got to get rid of that uh, cutter pin. Well, I am going to have to get me a set of these. Look at that. That worked like a charm. You know, I've never used one before, but uh, you know what? I think it's definitely something I'm gonna invest in for the future, because even things, everything, even my, tr my truck. You know, of course, I roll with a Dodge Ram, so you know, the steering's loose on that. <laughs> but uh, I probably gotta do a little work on that some point in time. So I think I'm gonna invest in myself in a set of these. Now, I definitely, I used the bigger one. The small one was too small, and uh, this one, well, she's a snap-on, so a little above my budget. <laughs> it won't be a snap-on one I'm getting, but I'm sure I can get a set that's uh, relatively inexpensive, but still okay. Maybe OTC sells one, but that's it. Let's get this off, pop that joint out of there, and yank the steering line out. There's a whole steering line or steering track or whatever you want to call it everything that's in there this is the end that the, that the power steering box is on so 
your, what is that, their pitman arm. That's what they call the pitman on that side, I think. And then, of course, tie rods. These are these are the ones that bolt to the back of the spindle. And, uh, yeah, it's the whole assembly. Now, I did come across something, which I thought was very strange on the Internet, but I did find a site claiming they have rebuild kits for these these ends, and they were cheap. There was like, they're almost nothing. Now, I never heard of rebuilding the heads of these uh, little ball joints. I don't didn't even know it was possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one apart gently just to see what's in there. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe it comes apart somehow. Never heard of that before. Maybe it just, I don't know, might have been something else that I saw, but we'll give it a try. Lower torsion bar is completely apart, taken apart, and good to go. There's still a few little things like i got to get the bump stop off and, of course, the ball joint. I want to get my welder out. I'll pull those out of there. And i got everything marked. So I did this with a marker before I pulled it out of the assembly. The two lines mean it goes to the lower control arm. So what I did is I put used a file, put two little scores on there in line with the top of the hex. And I put a score in there. Same goes for the other end. Got my little score there. And this will be on the other, it's there, it's on the other side. But uh, that's so that when I put it back together, uh, this car is now 60 years old. It's officially 60 years old. And sitting in the woods and just general use, I'm sure these bars probably got a curve that's in them. So I want to make sure I get them back the same way so the front end sits as level as it can. If it doesn't, we'll go from there. Might have to change adjustments. These here, this here are the adjustments under the car. And they take a huge bolt, which is, must be stolen to the car. Actually, I got them over here on the ones I painted. Right here. That's the big adjusting bolt, with six inches long. That's what uh, puts tension on those. That goes up on top of the frame into a notch. And you just start pulling that bolt in. And as it raises that uh, big teardrop part up, this piece here, that puts tension on that bar causing it to give you that suspension in the front end. So there is a way to adjust it, and we can adjust it if we find that one side is drooping too much. And now with the power of the internet and cameras and time, I cleaned everything up. I wasn't going to go through more videos of more grinding, blasting, painting, priming, the whole thing. So this is basically everything on the left-hand side of the car. Got it all cleaned up. Everything come out good, come apart well, got everything coated, rust treated, the whole works. Everything is nice. Inner and outer bearings, and got them in. Uh, one thing I am missing though is this seal. I cannot, I cannot find this seal. Which is a weird looking little thing. I don't want to really reuse it, but I don't know. It doesn't look bad. And where it sits in here, there is no groove at all. Maybe it's okay. Might, might use it. I don't know. If I have to, I will. Then over here, of course, we have everything for the right-hand side of the car. Same thing. Got my bearings in. Waiting on some bushings. Got some stops and stuff. But upper um, upper control arm bushings I need. I need uh, lower bushings for the torsion bar and the sway bar. And a few other odds and ends that are coming. So it is what it is. Unfortunately, I have to wait on that stuff. But... This is probably the end of another long video. So I hope you guys are enjoying this stuff. Fire is out for sure. And I'm calling her an end. I want to thank everyone for following along. You new subscribers, welcome aboard. Uh, don't forget to like the videos. Comments are greatly appreciated. I love reading them all and following along. Catch you guys again later.